Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the ninth episode of our 12 part series on various types of cancers of human body. Uh, as you know, that for the last more than a month, we have been deliberating on the different aspects of cancer in our body, how to diagnose them, how to detect them early, what is the kind of pathology, what kind of radiology, and how to treat them. In today's meeting, for about one hour or so, we shall be deliberating upon possibly what is the most important type of cancer in India, at least, are the head and neck cancers with a special emphasis on oral cancers. So, we will be hitting off uh, from the early diagnosis, the pathology and different aspects of the surgery and other chemotherapy and radiation. Uh, this is very important because in India, the oral cancer prevalence and incidence is very high. It is a very preventable disease. It can be diagnosed early and treated very well with a high degree of cure rates. Yet, a lot in not number of huge number of Indians continue to die of this disease because of various reasons. Most important thing of them possibly is the failure to diagnose them early. So to start with, Dr. Ramakant Sridhi, our oral uh, maxillofacial surgeon, he will be discussing how to early diagnose and prevent oral cancers. Over to Dr. Reddy. Thank you, Dr. Bhattacharya. I welcome you all for this uh, another exciting session on head and neck cancer and uh, I will be speaking very briefly about the risk factors and early diagnosis of head and neck cancers with special emphasis on oral cancer. As the, we have emphasized early, head and neck area is one of the most important areas in our body. It houses vital organs and aids in vital functions. Any kind of undetected cancer in this region can have devastating and far-reaching consequences in terms of the health and well-being of the patient. And oral cancer is the 16th most common cancer in the world as per the 2018 uh, worldwide statistics. And unfortunately, our country, India, has the dubious distinction of having the largest number of oral cancer cases uh, across the world. And uh, it also has one third of the total oral cancer global burden. Oral cancer is one of the most debilitating and disfiguring disease. Of course, this is true if it is not detected early and not treated early. And uh, looking briefly into the various risk factors for oral cancer, the, the most important risk factors would be uh, heavy alcohol consumption and uh, tobacco, whether it is smoked or chewed. These two are the uh, prime risk factors and they have a, an adverse effect on the DNA of the cells and most often they tend to act synergistically. So if a person consumes alcohol and also smokes or chews tobacco, his risk of oral cancer uh, rises significantly. The other risk factors are age, a any person above 40 uh, is in a risk category. Male gender is more prone because of various exposures and of course there is a familial or a genetic predisposition towards this cancer. Prior history of oral or aerodigestive tract cancer can also be a risk factor especially for a recurrence and presence of potentially malignant lesions or conditions in the mouth uh, is another risk factor. Uh, uh, an immune deficiency disease like HIV or prolonged immunosuppression as a part of a chemotherapy or uh, treatment for other conditions can also uh, trigger cancer. The other risk factors are dietary deficiencies, especially vitamin A, C and E, iron of course, uh, trace elements like selenium and zinc and uh, there are chronic infections, especially viral, inf viral infections like human papilloma virus which can cause cancer in the oropharyngeal region and of course chronic candidal infections can also trigger oral cancer. Excessive exposure to sunlight is a, a, an important trigger for uh, oral cancer and uh, especially in terms of a nasopharyngeal cancer, the risk factors are slightly different. Any exposure to wood dust, formaldehyde, asbestos or nickel, which is usually a part of uh, occupational exposure, people working in textile industry or tanning industry, exposure to asbestos, they are more prone to nasopharyngeal cancer. Uh, mouth cancer, especially in the early stage, does not cause any noticeable signs or symptoms. This uh, gives a sense of false sense of security to, the, security to the patient and he does not seek early help or screening. Early detection of oral cancers saves lives, of course, because the longer a cancer is left undetected or untreated, uh, the, the greater the size it reaches and the more the possibility of it spreading to other parts of the body or metastasis. 
Now, briefly looking at what are the kind of symptoms, early symptoms, what can uh, what a patient can present with an oral cancer uh, and what can appear as a red flags for any healthcare professional who is screening the patient. Usually, it is a kind of an ulcer uh, which are painful and do not usually heal within few weeks and the threshold should be about two or three weeks. If something is not healing during that time frame, then it is best to get it checked. Unexplained persistent lumps in the mouth or neck that do not go away on their own. Unexplained loose teeth or sockets that do not heal after extractions normally. Any kind of persistent numbness in the, especially in the area of lip and chin. And of course, uh, white patches or lining the oral mucosa or sometimes it can also present as a red patch uh, lining in the mouth. Pain or difficulty in swallowing can also be one of the initial symptoms. Uh, so can be the changes in voices or problems with speech. Difficulty in mouth opening or moving the jaw. And uh, in cases of uh, maxillary sinus cancer, uh, the lump can spread downwards and sometimes it can present with a very simple symptom like a loosening denture or an ulcer in the palatal region. So, all these uh, signs and symptoms in the mouth should trigger uh, a reason to search or diagnose the lesion. Of course, uh, unintentional weight loss which is significant in a very short period of time can also be one of the early symptoms. So, oral cancer as we mentioned earlier is clearly a lifestyle disease and because it is a lifestyle disease, it can be easily preventable and uh, the best way to prevent is to stay away from carcinogens like tobacco, alcohol and of course, maintain a healthy balanced diet. But uh, these are not that easy to be followed by general public or anyone. So, the onus usually rests on uh, regular checkups early screening, early detection, especially in the high risk groups. I emphasize once again uh, a thorough screening in high risk groups and thank you all for this opportunity. Thank you Dr. Reddy, that thank was you, very brief and very to the point and emphasizes the fact that prevention is possibly the most important factor. Now for the doctors or the physicians who are possibly watching this show, yes. I want to ask one question on their behalf. Uh, for a physician who sees any of the symptoms in any of his patients, uh, what are the red flags that he should consider that it could not, it could be a something more than a simple aphthous or a stress ulcer and for how long one should wait before that patient is referred to a specialist oncology consultation? Yeah, uh, that is a very pertinent question Dr. Bhattacharya and I mean the, the, the threshold period I would say is about two weeks. Uh, if an ulcer, any lump or bump in the mouth especially an oral ulcer is not healing or going away when you take away the trigger like a sharp tooth, then I think we should not waste much time in taking a biopsy and quickly sending it for an urgent evaluation histopathologically. Uh, I would say two weeks is the threshold period, at the most three, but if it, something is not healing within that time period, I would not hesitate much in taking a biopsy. Thank you doctor, that was very pointed. Uh, thank you for your time. Thank you. We should move on to the next speaker. Now. As Dr. Reddy said that once you have a doubt of something being not a benign disease, uh, one should take a biopsy and send it for examination. And oral malignancies do not start becoming cancer overnight. There is a long latency period during which it progresses from being a benign lesion to a malignant lesion through a series of events, a series of unfortunate events if I may say so. Um, so, a pathologist impression about what is happening is very, very important in that. And I would request Dr. Nayana to give us a focus on how one should look at the pre-malignant signs and uh, possibly detect a cancer that is going to happen tomorrow today itself. Over to Dr. Nayana. Am I audible? Okay, good evening everyone. Uh, the topic I will be dealing today is diagnosing pre-malignant conditions in head and neck. The cancers of head and neck are 
predominantly squamous cell carcinomas of oral cavity oropharynx, larynx hypopharynx, nasopharynx, nasal cavity and paranasal sinuses. The non-malignant, uh, the non-squamous cell carcinomas belong to thyroid, salivary glands, sarcomas of soft tissue and heart tissue. More than 90% of the head and neck malignancies are of squamous cell carcinomas. So, uh, we'll be restricting our talk to this. So, what are these pre-malignant lesions? It's a, they are benign, morphologically altered tissue that has a greater than normal risk of becoming malignant. The most common ones are oral leukoplakia, erythroplakia, oral submucosal fibrosis, HPV related lesions. So, the importance of early detection and biopsy, as we all know, the clinical stage at the time of diagnosis is the most important predictor of recurrence, mortality and morbidity. Patient survival rates can be improved if a cancerous lesion is detected at early stage and treated prior to malignant progression. Malignant potential of these lesions cannot be accurately predicted on the basis of clinical characteristics alone. Hence, biopsy and histopathological evaluation is essential for all suspicious lesions. So, like in any other region cancers, oral squamous cell carcinomas also go on through a process of change. There will be initially hyperplasia leading to mild dysplasia, wherein the lower one third of the layers of epithelium is, shows dysplasia, then moderate dysplasia wherein more than one third to two third layer shows dysplasia and then severe dysplasia or carcinoma in situ where the superficial layers are also sh start showing dysplasia eventually moving on to invasive squamous cell carcinoma. In all these dysplasias there is no uh, invasion of the basement membrane but in invasive squamous cell carcinoma so it uh, breaks through the barriers and involves the subepithelium and beyond. Currently, there is a limited role of cytology because of difficulty in sampling adequate tissue and the epithelial, epithelial urtipia if present is difficult to classify as either reactive or dysplastic in the absence of architectural features. The pattern of keratinization also cannot be assessed appropriately. Coming to individual lesions, leukoplakia, it is a hyperkeratotic white plaque or patch of mucosa exhibiting clonality and representing precursor lesion to squamous cell carcinoma. The annual malignant transformation is about 3 percent, most strongly predicted by the presence of dysplasia on biopsy. Biopsy is required for diagnosis and also the stratification in all the lesions, especially in leukoplakia because it represents benign hyperkeratosis in 80 percent cases, dysplasia in 12 percent carcinoma in C2 in 3 percent and invasive carcinomas in 5 percent cases. Erythropachia or red patch is even more ominous and it represents carcinoma in 51 percent cases, CV dysplasia in 40 percent of the cases, mild to moderate dysplasia in 9 percent cases. Erythroleukoplakia or speckled leukoplakia is a combination of leukoplakia and erythroplakia also has a higher frequency of advanced dysplasia on biopsy. Now, this is one of the examples and photomicrograph of gingival leukoplakia. Left side shows the normal tissue. Right side, right side we can see hyperkeratosis. There is increase in the keratinization and also there is increase in the thickness of the epithelium, especially of the granulosis layer. There is no evidence of dysplasia or no loss of polarity is seen. So, this is just a case of leukoplakia in which there is hyperkeratosis and hypergranulosis. Uh, we diagnose dysplasia based on a bunch of cytologic and architectural changes. This is a normal epithelium exhibiting normal maturation wherein the basal layers are immature and as we progress towards the top layer there is adequate maturation, the maturation increases. Whereas these are the dysplastic lesions in which there is architectural changes like drop like uh, uh, retapegs and there is loss of polarity, individual uh, cell keratinization uh, which is seen in the lower layers, there is increase NC ratio of the cells, hyperchromatia, 
uh, prominent nucleoli are seen and mitosis is also seen in the topmost layers. So, this is where the uh, pathologists come into play and they can tell which at which stage the lesion is in, whether there is dysplasia or not. Now, coming to oral submucosal fibrosis, it is a chronic debilitating disease characterized by inflammation and progressive fibrosis of the submucosal tissues resulting in marked rigidity and eventual inability to open mouth. This is a reactive lesion, but risk factor for squamous cell carcinoma is 7 to 30 percent, especially seen in habitual arachnid chewers. Now, coming to human papilloma virus and oral precancerous lesions. HP, HPVs are DNA viruses categorized depending on their oncologic potential as either high risk subtypes which include HPV 16, 18 uh, or low risk, uh, risk subtypes HPV 6, 11. The ro low risk HPVs have been implicated in the pathogenesis of squamous cell papillomas, common wart and condyloma accumulata etc. High risk types in particular 16 and 18 have been associated with precancerous and cancerous oral and oropharyngeal epithelial lesions. HPV associated tumors are known to have better prognosis because of involvement in a younger age group and higher chemo and radio sensitivity. P16 IHC is a surrogate marker to designate a high risk HPV associated oropharyngeal cancer and precancers. As per the CAP protocol, P16 overexpression is determined by intense nuclear and cytoplasmic staining in more than 70 percent of the cells as you can see in this picture. And these are the typical coilocytic changes in the cells where you can see a resinoid nuclei surrounded by a cytoplasmic halo. Now, this was about the precancerous lesions. Now, when we get a cancerous lesion specimen, we usually grade it by the histopathological grading system, uh, depending on the ker keratinization, nuclear uh, pleomorphism, mitosis, etc., as well differentiated, moderately differentiated, and poorly differentiated squamous cell carcinomas. The well differentiated has more keratinization, as you can see, and mitosis is about 0 to 1 per high power field. Moderately differentiate, differentiated lesions have uh, less keratinization, increased nuclear pleomorphism, and mitosis of about 2 to 3 per high power field. Poorly differentiated are worse, uh, they lack keratinization and nuclear pleomorphism is extreme. We also assess the depth of invasion. Depth of invasion is a good, good prognosticator of survival in oral cavity squamous cell carcinoma patients. We do that by uh, taking from the basement membrane of the normal surrounding normal epithelium until the maximum invading front. So, this depth of invasion is also part of the uh, primary tumor staging. The next thing is worst pattern of invasion determination. There are five types of worst pattern of invasions. The first one is a pushing border. The second type is a finger like projection uh, of invasion. The third one is islands of more than 15 cells. And uh, the fourth pattern is along with these islands, we see single cell invasion. And the fifth and the most bad is this tumor satellites of more than 1 mm from the primary tumor. Apart from that, we also look for lymphovascular invasion and perineural invasion. Uh, for lymphovascular invasion, you can see this is the endothelium lined space filled with the tumor cells, carries a worse prognosis. And also, uh, this is a uh, nerve fibers surrounded by cancer cells, also a bad prognosis. So, concluding this topic, I would like to say that biopsy plays a key role in risk stratification and pre-malignant lesions. Histopathology is also helpful in prognosticating once the cancer has developed. Thank you. Over to you, sir. Thank you, Dr. Nana. Very lucid and simple understanding of the pathological characteristics. Uh, I would like to know from you that what is the typical time scale involved in a pre-malignant condition moving into a malignancy so that one can have a window of intervention? Sir, it is very difficult to say because uh, it, uh, the time frame is, it can be huge and also less also. So, so is there something of subtype that can be getting into a cancerous uh, stage faster than the others and which are those? Uh, as I said, the moderately differentiated or the, the high grade ones, 
will become cancer sooner than the low grade ones so detecting the mild dysplastic ones will be, will help uh, help the patient thank you dr naira uh, once uh, disease from the clinical suspicion with the help of a biopsy is diagnosed to be malignancy one needs to correlate it with the spread of the tumor and how much extent the growth has been and complementary to the pathology reporting is the radiology which not only tells you about the tumor type also about the extent and i request dr gayatri to throw some light on the radiological aspects of head and neck cancers thank you sir good evening i'm dr gayatri and i'll talk in brief about the role of imaging in head and neck malignancies so the goals of imaging in head and neck malignancies like in any other system are first is to establish the extent and the size of the tumor so we are trying to do the t staging first the size of the tumor and the local regional invasion the next is to assess the nodal disease in the neck that is the end staging the other is looking for perineural spread so in patients with head and neck malignancies there is always a predilection for perineural spread especially around the trigeminal nerve branches or the facial nerve branches so this has to be specifically mentioned in imaging because it carries a very specific prognostication factor so once the disease is diagnosed and treated either by chemotherapy or radiotherapy or with surgery it is important to image to distinguish a tumor recurrence from either a post operative or a post radiation related changes and to monitor response to treatment as well so the main stay of imaging in head and neck malignancies is ct and mri uh, except in thyroid so thyroid is one area in the head and neck region which is very well assessed by ultrasound but when it comes to all the other areas it is mainly the ct or mri now between ct and mri this is a difficult decision to make mri certainly has a theoretical advantage in overall head and neck area in differentiating soft tissues but ct has a definite advantage in terms of speed in the sense it might take over half an hour for a patient to completely undergo a plain and contrast mr study in the head and neck area so if you are trying to image the larynx or the hypopharynx the patient is bound to have some episodes of swallowing and various other movements which is bound to degrade the image quality where especially in larynx and hypopharynx in a few seconds you get a very beautiful cct image which is why especially in these two areas ct scores over mr slightly in all other areas mri is generally the preferred modality but ct can also help in problem solving or vice versa and ct helps especially when we trying to look at subtle bone erosion especially in ca larynx when we trying to look at erosion of the cartilages or we trying to look at erosion of the mandible or the maxilla in the oral, oral cavity cancers even subtle sclerosis is much better picked up and unless the marrow is invaded or infiltrated like in mandible it's hard to pick up these changes on mr early so that's about ct versus mri but whether it's ct or mr it is very very important to make it a contrast study so a plain study will not be able to differentiate between sometimes between a normal and an abnormal tissue also and sometimes between edematous and tumor tissue which is why it's very very important to have a contrast study both in ct as well as in mri so this this is a very popular diagram like everybody familiar with head and neck Uh, malignancies or imaging will know that facial planes are what we're trying to look at. So there are certain neck spaces which are categorized anatomically, uh, depending on the way the fascia in the head and neck infiltrates the tissue. So the deep fascia in the neck splits and encases tissue in varying patterns. Uh, for example, we can see that the ramus of mandible together. with the muscles around it which is labeled as number 3 is the masticator space so the contents of this space are unique in the sense it contains the mandible together with the muscles whereas if you look at number 5 which is seen on both the images this is the carotid space it has a carotid vessel the jugular vessel together with the uh, neurovascular bundle along it along with it and also some lymph nodes so the reason why it's important to know these spaces especially for a radiologist is each has its own specific contents for example we are now looking at a tumor in the parotid space so we know that we are dealing with a parotid tumor based on the location and if you look at this example this is a lesion a t2 and stir hyperintense lesion in the carotid space so this is the contents of this space will only determine what kind of a tumor could come there it can be a carotid body tumor or it can be a schwannoma like in this case sometimes it can even be a lymph nodal mass and it's also important to know these spaces because when we see a tumor extending beyond one particular space in its facial confines we know that the t staging is higher which is why to reemphasize it is important to know the facial planes and this neck spaces 
and not only this that was for the anatomical description in terms of contents and the facial planes but there is another functional unit uh, in the head and neck based on which the T staging is done and also the N staging is done. So, for example, the nasal cavity and the PNS have their own specific T and N staging because the lymph nodal drainage for this area is unique. So, is the local regional tumor spread pattern and also the nerve invasion pattern. So, based on this pattern of functional units, the T and N staging for each of these areas differs. So, the nasal cavity and PNS together are treated as a unit for a T and N staging. So, is the oral cavity which includes the buccal mucosa, the gingiva, the tongue, especially the anterior part. And then we have the three components of the pharynx, the nasopharynx, then the oropharynx, the oropharynx also includes the posterior most part of the tongue. So, the image to the right shows you that number 3 is the nasopharynx, number 4 is the oropharynx which has the posterior one third of the tongue, whereas number 2 is the anterior uh, two thirds of the tongue which is part of the oral cavity. The oropharynx will also include the tonsils and the lateral walls there. And then come the hypopharynx and larynx, each again having its own T staging and uh, the pattern of tumor spread and also the nodal pattern of drainage. The major and minor salivary glands again have a separate staging. For example, a parotid tumor will have its own T staging, whereas the submandibular will have its own staging and also nodal drainage areas. And the thyroid again is separate. So, it is important to know the facial planes in terms of anatomy in the specific neck space and also to know the functional units in terms of TNM staging. Now, we will just look at a few examples. Now, oral cavity being the predominant area of concern in India, depending on the demographic factors that was just described to us, uh, there are specific techniques which help elucidate or elaborate the oral tumors better on imaging. So, one of those is the puff, puff cheek technique. So, once the patient is instructed to puff his cheek and fill it with air, the buccal mucosa nicely spreads out. And, de and is delineated very well. So, is the gingivobuccal sulcus and also the retromolar tigone. So, we look at this example where to the left we have an image uh, showing a mild thickening of the buccal mucosa, but we are not very sure if it is actually eroding the mandible or if it is involving the sulcus. In the same patient once we have a puffed cheek section, we see that the air nicely delineates this thickening and shows that, that shows that it is nowhere close to the mandible, it is only confined to the buccal mucosa. So, the puffed cheek technique is a very, very useful technique. I would encourage everybody to use this, it is very, very useful to exactly determine the extent of the tumour. Now, it is also important to look at the local, uh, advanced, locally advanced tumor in terms of its involvement of the adjacent bony structures and also the soft tissues. So, in this example, the one to the left is an extensive CA buccal mucosa involving the lateromolar trigone and it is also cranially extended to erode the floor of the left maxillary sinus. And uh, to the right, we have another locally advanced tumor where there is an orocutaneous fistula because of an ulcerated tumor which is extended all the way up to the skin and also ulcerated there. So, locally advanced cancer which is also very well demonstrated when we do a puff, puff cheek view. So, again emphasizing on the importance of this view. Now, the tongue, the anterior two thirds also form a part of the oral cavity like mentioned previously. The posterior one, to, one third of the tongue which is also called the base of tongue is treated along with tumors of the oropharynx for the T and N staging. So, when it comes to imaging of the tongue, MRI scores very much over CT because the tongue being a completely soft tissue organ has uh, multiple intrinsic as well as the extrinsic muscles and it extends all the way to the floor of the mouth and it is important for us to describe all of this. There is a median raphe dividing it into a left and right half. So, it is important for us to locate a tumor and say whether it is crossing the midline or it is not. It is important to again say if it is in the anterior two thirds or the posterior part of the tongue. It is important to describe if it is gone all the way to the floor of the mouth, especially involving the myelohyoid muscle and also to look at the sublingual space because the preserved fat in this area says that the neurovascular bundle in the floor of the mouth is spared, whereas obliteration of the fat shows that there is involvement of the neurovascular bundle. So, to show a few examples, this is a contrast enhanced MRI which very beautifully depicts an enhancing tumor in the anterior two thirds of the tongue. We can see that it is located only to the right of midline, not reaching up to the midline and definitely not crossing it. Whereas in this example which is a coronal image, we can see an enhancing tumor in the left half of the tongue which is not only confined to the left half but also crossing the midline. And caudally, if you look at the craniocaudal extent, it is involving the intrinsic and the extrinsic muscles of the tongue and extending to the sublingual fat space and also bilateral nodes. We can also see bilateral submandibular nodes. 
The third example is a further locally advanced carcinoma where there is not only involvement of the sublingual uh, neurovascular bundle but there is infiltration of the floor of the mouth as well and also possibly involving the mandible. So, these are examples of CA tongue. So, like I mentioned left half or the right half or whether it is crossing the midline or confined to one half of the midline and also look at involvement of the sublingual fat space and infiltration into the floor of the mouth and MR is very very good for imaging tongue with contrast. So, there are times when malignancy is just present as neck nodal masses, they clinically present uh, in the, in the to the clinicians with just an enlarged group of neck nodes. It is hard to say whether these are uh, uh, on clinical examination, these could either be tuberculosis node again since we are talking about the common diseases in India or if it is a secondary malignancy. Often biopsy when it is shown as squamous cell carcinoma, it is important to have imaging to see, look for the source of primary. So, here is a case of the uh, malignancy in the left oropharynx. So, it is involving the tonsil which has actually presented clinically as a neck nodal mass, a necrotic conglomerate next left sided neck node mass. That was about the oral cavity mainly and the oropharynx. Now, coming to larynx. Now, unlike almost in all the cases in CT scanning, the patients are instructed to take in a deep breath and hold. Now, this must not be done for larynx because doing this will cause opposition of the vocal folds. So, when it comes to imaging the larynx, it is important to instruct the patient to just have quiet breathing. So, in quiet breathing, both the vocal folds are separated and the anatomy of the larynx is very well depicted. We can see the anterior commissure, both the vocal folds and also the, the black arrow points to the arytenoid uh, cartilage to which the vocal folds attach. So, for larynx, it is important to have quiet breathing. The same is shown in the coronal image where the laryngeal ventricle is very well demonstrated. So, this kind of imaging in quiet breathing is important to localize whether there is a tumor or no tumor. It is involvement, the involvement of the anterior commissure to see if there is a uh, transglottic extension, whether it is extending to the supraglottis or to the subglottic part of the larynx. So, this is an example again. In larynx, like I mentioned previously, MR is a little difficult if the patient is not being very cooperative because even a little bit of swallowing or coughing movement can completely degrade the image. Whereas, CCT will very well depict the anatomy with quiet breathing and also show us the extent, the involvement of the anterior commissure. Like for this example, uh, there is involvement of the anterior commissure, there is involvement of both the vocal folds and not only that, there is also erosion of the thyroid cartilage. So, cartilage erosion is very well depicted on CT. Now, coming to supraglottic larynx, which is above the level of the laryngeal ventricle, these malignancies like in this example, the image to the left shows a thickening, asymmetric thickening of the left epiglottic fold. So, this is the supraglottic larynx. So, these are very, very rich in lymphatic uh, network, which is why they often again tend to present as neck nodal masses. So, in this patient, we can look at the image on the right, where there is a conglomerate neck left sided neck nodal mass and this was the presenting symptom in the patient and the further examination and uh, imaging showed that this was actually a tumor of the supraglottic larynx. Transglottic cancers, it is very very important to describe tumors of the larynx as which compartment they belong to whether it is supraglottis, glottis or the subglottis because this determines the kind of surgery or the treatment that the patient has to undergo. So, this example is that of a transglottic spread of tumor where there is involvement of the supraglottis that is the top axial image, erosion of the thyroid cartilage as well as the whole tumor which is obliterating the larynx. Now, if you look at the cut below, this is the subglottis. We are below the level of the glottis at the level of the cricoid cartilage. Now, the tumor has extended all the way here. And uh, the sagittal image also shows that the base of the epiglottis is also thickened. So, this is a transglottic malignancy. Uh, the, the involvement of the larynx in one of these compartments, be it supraglottic, glottic or subglottic is what determines whether the patient is going to go for a voice sparing surgery or not. Now, MR in larynx can help with problem solving like for this example where CT could not really show a mass properly, but a contrast enhanced MR can actually show thickening of the left vocal fold together with infiltration of the tumor into the paraglottic fat as well. So, CT first, but MR will help in problem solving for larynx. Now, like mentioned previously, thyroid is very well evaluated with ultrasound. So, this has to be the first line of investigation whenever there is a thyroid mass suspected and there is also a thyroid's classification which describes whether a tumor or a lesion detected in the thyroid is more towards the benign side or towards the malignant side and how to go about it. So, this is an example of ultrasound showing a papillary carcinoma. This is an irregular uh, mass lesion of uh, hypo hypoechoic mass lesion with very irregular borders and also having microcalcification. So, this is a classic papillary carcinoma. CT and MR do help 
once there is a mal uh, once there is a lesion characterized within the thyroid ct and mr help describe the relationship of the mass to the surrounding structures to look for extra thyroid extension and also for nodal staging like for this example this is an anaplastic thyroid malignancy where we can see that on ct the mass is infiltrating the strap muscles it has completely infiltrated and obliterated the trachea and also displaced the esophagus the yellow arrow is the esophagus the trachea is almost not seen it's completely infiltrated and obliterated so the loco regional spread of the tumor is best seen on ct and mr whereas the early small nodules are best seen on ultrasound for thyroid for everything else we only go for cross sectional modality now the role of imaging post treatment so in post treatment evaluation contrast study is a must because post post radiation edema is very very uh, frequently seen and unless we do a contrast study we're not going to know if it's an edema or if it's a recurrent tumor tissue there and whenever there is a problem in determining if it's a tumor recurrence or not pet ct is very very helpful like for this example of a nasopharyngeal carcinoma which had a radiation we can see that contrast study does not show any nodular enhancement there's just smooth enhancement surrounded by edema but in this example there is some nodular thickening around the left eustachian tube in the nasopharynx. PET CT very well shows that there is a PET avid lesion in the post RT bed. So, this is a recurrent tumor. So, in post treatment evaluation, PET CT is very, very important as an adjunct to either CT or MR with contrast. Post radiation changes are again very common. So, it, it, uh, one has to be careful before labeling any swelling as a tumor. So, this is a post RT edema and uh, to the left is a tumor, to the right is just edema, that's not a tumor recurrence. The other important role of imaging is to look for perineural tumoral spread. So, this can present either as denervation of the muscle, like in this example, the pterygoid muscles, or it can just present as obliteration of the fat around the muscle, or it can, it can appear like proper thickening of the nerve along with the neurovascular bundle. So, neck nodes again, it's important to stage for each level. So, either as submandibular sublingual nodes, the jugular nodes being level 2, 3 and 4 and the, sub, and the posterior cervical nodes beyond the, behind the sternopleidomastoid muscles and also the level 6 nodes which are pretracheal. So, this neck nodal staging is important, but it differs from each level like we mentioned previously, it's a functional unit. An oropharyngeal carcinoma is a different functional unit from a laryngeal carcinoma and the nodal uh, spread is different for each. Image also plays a major role when it comes to guided interventions, especially in thyroid and in nodal spread. So, the take four points are TCT versus MRI, CT especially for larynx. Contrast study is very, very important, be it CT or for MR. Ultrasound is very good for thyroid and also for image guided interventions. The TNM staging, bone cartilage involvement are all to be mentioned as part of the radiology report. Perineural spread is very, very unique to almost all head and neck malignancies and this needs to be actively looked for. Post treatment evaluation, if necessary, do take the help of PET CT here. Thank you very much for your patient hearing. Thank you, Dr. Gayatri. Excellent exposition and overview of the key things about uh, radiological diagnosis of ethnic malignancies. It is so structured, I felt that I have gone back to my postgraduate class. Uh, I just have one question for you. It's often a uh, common clinical find, finding to have a neck node presentation without any uh, finding in the clinical uh, finding in the in the oral cavity or in the uh, visually inspected areas in the head and neck area. So, in that case, when we have a nodal disease without any primary that we can see, obviously, what kind of imaging do you suggest? I would initially suggest a CT, sir. Okay. Uh, because it's quick and uh, if at all the CT isn't helping, MR should be for problem solving because even mild edema, subtle edema can also show up a lot on MR, but a CT will actually uh, okay. show, show it up there. Mainly, we have to look at focal areas, like I mentioned, mainly the pharynx and the supraglottic larynx. CT first and MR is problem solving. Okay. So, thank you very much. Uh, we, shall, we shall move over to the, from the diagnosis to uh, the treatment part now. And all head and neck cancers, they start with the possibility of surgical excision. As far as the head and neck, most of the head and neck malignancies are concerned, unless it's a, a midline one, the oral cavity, tongue, etc., uh, we would prefer to you know, uh, think of a surgical option first. And I would request our uh, consultant oncologist, Dr. Ramakrishna, to give a brief idea not only about the surgical part of it, but how reconstruction helps in restoring the quality of life in these patients. Thank you very much. Good evening, I am Dr. Ramakrishna Prasad, Consultant Surgical Oncologist, AAG Hospitals. Today my topic would be uh, head and neck cancer advances 
in surgery and reconstruction. Head and neck cancer is a very vast topic and to cover it, it is very difficult in a limited time. So, so, today I would be discussing mainly about the oral cavity malignancies. Head and neck cancers are the tumours that arises from the upper aerodigestive tract mucosa which includes oral cavity, pharynx, that is oropharynx, nasopharynx, hypopharynx, larynx, nose and paranasal sinuses. As I have been discussed previously, most of them are mainly squamous cell carcinomas because of the local uh, consumptive habits of tobacco smoking and uh, they usually present in advanced stage, that is locally advanced stage is the commonest uh, stage which we see in the office actually. Before we plan is any kind of surgery, it is always important in a cancer, for that matter in any, other, any, any cancer, it is always uh, good to have a uh, clinical confirmation. Uh, pathological confirmation and also staging workup to see what exactly is the stage of the cancer. Here in the evaluation of the head and neck cancer, it is mainly a good clinical examination which focuses, uh, helps in knowing a clinical stage of the head and neck cancer. For some patients which will have severe tenderness on palpation, it is always good to have an examination under anesthesia and at the same time good quality chunk biopsy, incisional biopsy from the edge of the tumor it helps in confirming the malignancy. And the uh, role of uh, radiology has been discussed previously. And of once of all the, all the investigations are done, we'll come to a conclusion whether it is an early stage or a locally advanced stage. As has been uh, described here, T1, T2, N0, M0 comes under early stage, and the locally advanced stage is the next to this. This slide uh, focuses the multidisciplinary approach uh, and uh, support from the all paraclinical uh, 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 paraclinical uh, modalities which will help in the good clinical outcome for the uh, head and neck cancer patient. You can see lot of things are there, head and neck uh, surgeon first, radiation oncologist, medical oncologist, plastic and reconstructive surgery, not just all the doctors, in addition to this para paraclinical uh, uh, physicians and all those things are very much important here. And coming to once you come to a clinical stage, we'll come to the planning the treatment plan. Actually, when, uh, we, we in AIG hospitals have a multidisciplinary tumor board for every uh, cancer, especially head and neck cancer, to decide the treatment plan preoperatively and what to be done, what exactly is the mode of uh, 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 therapy, and what are the adjuvant type of treatment we follow. This has all been uh, discussed with the patient and we given in a uh, tumor board uh, uh, prescription. And coming to the head and neck cancer, especially oral cavity cancer, surgery is the main modality of treatment, uh, treatment both in early and locally advanced stage. In, in uh, surgical uh, part, we aim to provide like complete and definitive tumor removal uh, with a good margins and uh, provide staging information which will help in appropriate adjuvant therapy. And it, it should be a balanced surgery, it should not be an under treatment, it should not be an over treatment because under treatment results in good uh, like high local recurrences whereas in over treatment results in uh, it, uh, decreased quality of life and uh, for all the clinicians out there it's always good to know what when not to do surgery these are the standard indications when we should not put a knife there is a direct extension to prevertebral fascia cervical vertebra mediastinal structures and common carotid and internal carotid encasement skull base involvement which is known in the ct scan by means of spinoid bone destruction or pterygoid plate destruction presence of subdermal metastasis which we quite often see sometimes it is it it, it indicates it is an unresectable stage and uh, no matter how far you do, how heroic surgeries you do, it, it always, uh, uh, it depends on the histopathology report. So, what defines exact adequate surgery? The single most important factor which tells the adequacy of the surgery is the margin status. It is a main prognostic factor for local recurrences and overall survival. There are three defined margins which were uh, described standard, uh, standardly, that is negative margin, close margin and the positive margin. The definition of the negative margin means distance from the invasive tumor front that is 5 mm or more from the resected margin. Whereas close margin is less than 5 mm, positive margin is presence of carcinoma in situ or invasive carcinoma at the margin of resection. And I would like to go in deep uh, because uh, understanding the tumor margin is very important. There are two types of tumor margins that is clinical margin and the surgical margins. Clinical margins is margins of tumor on clinical observation and as well as palpation. Whereas surgical margins means they refer to any tissue plane where the surgeon's knife meets the patient. These are two types, histological and molecular margins. And uh, assessment of surgical margins is always done intraoperatively by frozen section which we regularly do in every head and neck cancer, especially oral cavity cancer and sometimes where the resource constrained areas we can do an imprint cytology, of course it is never, it is somewhat less compared to frozen section and postoperatively by histopathology. 
and what are the uh, factors which affect the surgical margins there, this is very important and uh, for a surgical oncologist perspective even though if you take a good margin from during the surgery that is 1 cm from the clinical uh, or visible palpation in duration edge if you take 1 cm but the histopathology says that is a tumor is very much close because there is a factor called tissue shrinkage that is it happens after resection and pathologic processing and also decrease in the dimension of the tissue under tension on surgical release from the surrounding tissue there are certain intrinsic and extrinsic factors which will uh, cause the tissue shrinkage thereby resulting in a closed margin in the histopathology report. Uh, there are three studies which showing what, are, what is the reason and what are the sites which were usually involved in the shrinkage. Uh, we can see here buccal mucosa cancers which will have more tendency of tissue shrinkage. And coming to the molecular margin, these are the molecular margins. The concept is the latest one uh, because uh, determining the molecular status of the resected margins is one of the newer diagnostic methods. It can be known by IHC or genetic analysis. Even though if you take histopathologically, there, there is no invasive cancer at the margin, but there might be a genetic alteration at the margin level. It, if we detect that, it is uh, it, we can tell the patient to be in a close follow-up and follow us to use some adjuvant therapies so that it, it will help in decreasing the local recurrences. Coming to the oral cavity per se uh, surgical uh, modality, there are seven different subsites of oral cavity. You can see here lip, tongue, anterior two third, floor of the mouth, gingiva, upper and lower, buccal mucosa, retromolar trigon, and heart palate. Coming to the surgery pro problem, some basic principles I would like to discuss here. Uh, the, the term which we use in uh, surgical resection of uh, head oral cavity cancer mainly is the wide excision, that is, end block removal of the primary tumor with 1 cm gross clinical margin from the induration is very important. It is not the visible edge of the uh, uh, ulcer which we take, it is the palpation which we, which you, which, which we should see that induration. From the induration, it should be 1 cm and, uh, and also as the depth of invasion increases, we should compulsorily address the neck nodes. Here you can see a tongue cancer, uh, it, it looks like a T2 stage, uh, after wide excision, the primary closure has been done here. And uh, some cancers, for example, gingivobuccal complex tumors, they are close to the bone. What to do at these areas? There is a concept called marginal mandibulectomy. In this way, we remove a remo uh, rim of mandible or partial resection of mandible. There are uh, two, three types of marginal mandibulectomy are there and uh, it is usually done as a margin purpose, but not when there is a gross invasion. That means whenever there is a medullary space invasion into the mandible, we should not do a marginal mandibulectomy. Always it is to uh, remove a segment of the mandibulectomy. And there are certain predefined indications and uh, uh, contraindications for a marginal mandibulectomy. You can see here when the disease abets mandible but no erosion seen, it, marginal mandibulectomy is an indication. When cortical erosion is subtle, you can still do it because marrow space invasion is not there. And especially in irradiated patients and also edentulous patients, marginal mandibulectomy cannot be done, should not be done. And uh, the certain other indications for segmental mandibulectomy or hemimandibulectomy. When cortical erosion is extensive, for that matter, some paramandibular disease, segmental or hemimandibulectomy is indicated. And also certain neurovascular foramen which is there in the mandible, when they, these are getting involved, you should always consider doing a segmental or hemimandibulectomy. When, this, when soft tissue component is large with significant posterior spread to the masticator space, better to do a uh, hemimandibulectomy. This is a... Uh, uh, picture showing a marginal mandibulectomy for a carcinoma of the uh, left buccal mucosa. And this uh, uh, describes about the segmental and hemimandibulectomy which I uh, told you earlier. The red line there uh, you can see for the uh, posterior segmental mandibulectomy. If you cut at the green line, it is called hemimandibulectomy. And some advances in the traditional open surgery for that matter, it is a newer concept coming up is compartmental resections for a uh, oral cavity cancer. The entire anatomical compartment containing tumor is removed instead of removing tumor with 1 cm margin. The compartment is defined on the basis of anatomy of the site and pattern of the tumor spread. It is somewhat similar to the soft tissue sarcomas which we operate. That is, if at all the cancer involving one muscle, it is good to remove the from muscle from the origin to insertion. The three main components of the compartment surgery are identification of the primary lesion and all its potential pathways and the distinct territory at risk for metastatic parenchymal structures between the primary tumor and the cervical lymphatic chain and the radical and complete removal of this anatomical whole anatomical unit as a package end block removal is very much important and the preparation for a rational reconstruction there are two examples here for the compartment resection for example the right lateral border of the tongue uh, it's a cancer there is a compartmental resection of the tongue that is complete hemiglossectomy right from the infrahyoid release uh, floor of the mouth excision into uh, uh, hemiglossectomy 
and this is for the buccal mucosa if at all the buccal mucosa is close to the retromolar trigone or the carcinoma of the retromolar trigone uh, it is always good to remove the pterygoid muscle but if you take no, traditional open surgery 1 cm margin of the pterygoid muscle is taken but com coming to the compartmental surgery right from the origin to insertion medial pterygoid muscle it, compartmental is it, it helps in good uh, uh, improvement of the local recurrences why? What is the rational for compartment surgery? The chance of positive resection margin is high in conventional surgeries. And in compartment resection, the dissection is always in anatomical facial plane away from the tumor margin. This enables the surgeon to achieve negative margins in a three-dimensional and, and in a consistent manner. So, of course, there are some disadvantages with the compartment resection as well because uh, it, it requires definitely a reconstructive uh, uh, surgery uh, in addition to that only just surgery. Uh, fistula formation between the oral cavity and that is called OC fistula, delayed healing, radiation therapy, post are common uh, uh, are common in these things. But this is not been proven in the randomized data, but there are some uh, many studies showing that it, it helps in decreasing the local recurrences. And coming to the advances in other uh, uh, areas, uh, especially minimal invasive has been uh, very much useful in uh, oral pharyngeal malignancies. And uh, I would like to discuss all these things, central and lymph node biopsy, transoral robotic surgery, total laser microsurgery, micro endonasal endoscopic surgery, ultrasonic surgery and mechanical staplers. Uh, before going to the central lymph node biopsy, uh, it is a brief note on uh, neck dissections. Uh, there are two types of neck dissection uh, for the, all the clinicians out there. This is called comprehensive neck dissections, which include radical and modified radical neck dissections. And one more thing is selective neck dissections. When to do neck dissection? In addition to the primary tumor, it is always help. It, uh, uh, addressing the neck is very important. It depends on the depth of invasion. For example, uh, clinically and pathological node positive cancers, always we should do neck dissections. And known negative cancer, it, uh, when, whether to do or not, it depends on the depth of invasion of the primary tumor. Uh, it has been recommended that more than 3 mm depth of invasion for oral cavity squamous cell carcinoma neck dissection is mandatory. And all the node negative cancer we can do a selective kind of neck dissection based on the pattern of nodal pathology. Uh, the sentinel lymph node biopsy uh, has been adopted from uh, mucosal melanoma and some other areas uh, to the head and neck cancer as well. Because determining the depth of invasion is very difficult, it is always better to do an elective neck dissection for a node negative patients or do a central lymph node biopsy to uh, have that good uh, cosmetic outcomes later on. So, a central lymph node biopsy is an alternative to elective neck dissection for identifying occult cervical metastasis in a early T1 and T2 cancers. Of course, it is technically demanding and requires expertise and multiple studies, uh, even a randomized data have uh, have validated the efficacies of central lymph node biopsy. Almost up to 95% negative predictive value has been detected with central lymph node biopsy. Even the NCCN says central lymph node biopsy can be considered. Of course, there are some limitations with central lymph node biopsy as well because the, there are larger T tumors close to the lymph, lymph node region uh, tumors. And for example, tumor site flow of the mouth cancer, if you take the lymph node pathology uh, level 1B will be very close. And upper gingiva and heart pilot, there will be poor lymphatic drainage. Here you can see in a radiolobal collard and ICG being uh, used for detecting a central lymph node biopsy. Coming to the transoral robotic surgery, which is being commonly used, uh, especially in uh, other pelvic surgeries, but in head and neck, or mainly for the early oropharyngeal cancers. There is squamous cell carcinoma of the tonsil, base of tongue, and soft palate cancers are routinely approached with uh, transoral robotic surgery because what happens is in uh, Previously, we used to do midline uh, mandibulotomy and uh, complete uh, open book type of method which we, to approach the base of tongue uh, tumors by early stage especially. But TORS has uh, had, uh, made us uh, life easier by going to that area where which is, which is very difficult in open uh, type of thing. There are certain uh, definite advantages, equivalent cure rates, improved function, decreased gastrostomy and tracheostomy rates, minimal pharyngocutus fistulas. Drawbacks being it is a huge investment, post-op radiation is still required and need of neck dissection can be spared if chemo radiation is given. Uh, post-operative hemorrhage which is very vital in the incidence is around 3 to 8 percent. Here you can see the image, uh, the, the picture is downside that is uh, you can see the robot in place. And uh, we can also do a robotic neck dissections. This is the picture using the retroauricular incision which will help in a robotic neck dissection. And this is a total la laser microsurgery which is especially useful in early glottic cancer T1 and T2. Mainly CO2 laser is used. 
and advances in reconstruction traditionally we like previously uh, before the onset of pre-flash we always relied on pedicle flash but with the advancement of newer uh, modalities like a free radial forearm free flaps microvascular tissue transfer has become uh, is an e first option for every cancer and certain three dimensional computer planning for complex mandibular defects and prosthetic rehabilitation or some uh, recent advancements in the reconstruction. You can see a free radial forearm free flap being, being delivered here for the hemiglossectomy defect and it is a fibula free flap and 3D planning for complex defects. It is for especially for the segmental mandibulectomy which is very important. Here there is a virtual, virtual surgical planning uh, using reconstructed three dimensional images and the creation of staged cutting guide video, cutting guides to provide precise osteoment that is cut at what level we should cut the fibula to uh, easily match that opposite mandible is very important. You can see here there are predefined cutting uh, guides which will help in uh, using that and coming to the prosthetic reconstruction it is mainly as a palatal uh, uh, this thing hard palate defects or CA maxilla which will help in uh, using obturators for post malignant thank you. Thank you Dr. Ramakrishna excellent uh, overview of a very vast subject which you have managed to yes. finish in time. Uh, as he has rightly explained to you that surgery holds a very central role in head and neck malignancies and it is possibly the most significant impact on cure. Uh, are there any areas where in head and neck malignancy you would shy away from surgery, where you would not advise surgery? Yes sir, there are certain uh, specific indications where I would not be doing any sir, especially T4B disease uh, for uh, oral cavity malignancies, especially posterior uh, diseases where the surgical approaches will, re will require open midline mandible otomy. Any areas where a non-surgical uh, technique would be as curative and you would prefer to uh, no, preserve the organs by not Yeah, larynx is one organ which we can have an organ sparing approach, especially with the advancement of chemo radiation. It has become like organ sparing approach is very important. So, thank you doctor. You have given a very wonderful 360 degree view. Thank and uh, as, as Dr. Ramakrishna told that all head and neck cancers, they must be rooted through a multidisciplinary board, which consists of not just the surgeons, radiation oncologists, medical oncologists, but the pathologists, nuclear medicine and the radiologists. Uh, they are absolutely, and not only that, they should also be accompanied by a team of a team of nutritionists and rehabilitation specialists. And the reason for that is that the head and the cancer patient survivors, they do well and they live for many years and sometimes the scars of the treatment can be very, very, uh, you know, uh, determining factor for their quality of life. So therefore, uh, one of the approaches that one has to adopt is to limit the treatment from either one modality. In other words, don't go very aggressive with surgery don't go very aggressive with radiation, but you add more than one techniques in equal measures so that the side effects from any one technique is not overwhelming for the, for the patient. And uh, as a multidisciplinary treatment plan, surgery, radiation and chemotherapy all play in the fold. And I will give a very brief overview of the radiation, uh, radiotherapy as a subject, as then subsequently I move on to the role of radiation in head and neck cancers. And I will just tell you why it is important to adopt modern radiotherapy techniques, in, especially in head and neck cancers as of today. Now, radiation has been an effective tool for treating cancer for more than 100 years. And in India, more than 60% of the patients diagnosed with, diagnosed with cancer, especially head and neck cancers, will receive radiotherapy at some point of time in their treatment, either as a radical or as an adjuvant or as a palliative. The sources of ionizing radiation, essentially radiation uses uh, photons and gamma rays or in the more modern times, it uses very, very high energy x-rays that comes out of a linear accelerator uh, to treat the patient. And these days, it is all electronic. So, when you switch up the machine, there is no more radiation left. The patient who is treated with radiation is not radioactive. That patient can go home and play with his kids and, you know, eat food with the family members. It's, it, there is no fear of radiation contamination or lingering radioactivity in a patient who is being treated with radiation. And how does it act really? It basically damages the DNA of the cells and both the normal cells and the cancer cells can be damaged with radiation. However, the normal cells have a higher propensity for repair and the cancer cells have lower. So, one has to give radiation in such a way that the normal cells get less radiation and the cancer cells more 
allowing the cancer cells to die out and keep the toxicity to an acceptable limitation. And it is important that the radiation be delivered over a long time, fractionated, not in a single dose, barring some notable exceptions, especially for the, con for the in the context of head and neck cancers. It is given over a period of six to seven weeks every day in small doses, so that the toxicity, the side effects can be limited and the full therapeutic dose can be delivered. Now, there have been many techniques in which radiation can be given. Traditionally, two-dimensional radiotherapy was the norm maybe 10, 20, 30 years back. In almost last 20 years, what we call as a three-dimensional radiotherapy with the help of CT scans have come to play. But even that is inadequate uh, in terms of head and neck cancers. The reason for that is the complex anatomy of the head and neck areas where the structures like parotid, the spinal cord, the uninvolved oral mucosa, the pharyngeal muscles uh, which are very important in uh, subsequent degradation activities are very close to each other. And the dose required for radiation is significantly high for head and neck cancer patients. And it, there is every possibility of inadvertently exposing these parts to high doses of radiation which can have severe long term and short term consequences. Therefore, uh, adverse techniques like intensity modulated radiotherapy, image guidance or IGRT, intraoperative radiotherapy, stereotactic, uh, etc., have a very, very important role. Particle beam therapy has been coming up, although it's very, very uh, limited in its access, extremely expensive, and therefore the use of particle beam therapy must be considered in terms of both the cost and the benefit that it may offer, and it's very rare, so I will not discuss that. I will straight away jump to three dimensional radiotherapy that is used. The meaning of that is to use images, radiological images. You heard the radiology lecture before me. Uh, you know, a good radiology department is vital to the existence of any cancer department, especially so for a radiation oncology department. And we are just as good as our images. And we often use CT scan and PET and MRI scans to create a three-dimensional picture of the tumor and the surrounding anatomy. And that gives us an improved precision uh, in delivering the radiation and decreased normal tissue damage. Moving one step ahead of the, the three-dimensional uh, radiotherapy is a technique called IMRT or intensity modulation. It's, it basically uses a computerized algorithm in which rather than giving three, four or five uh, radiation beams, it uses hundreds of small beams or small beamlets as we call them uh, to cover the tumor area. And in that, even if the tumor is extremely irregular in shape and it's in close proximity or even wrapping around a normal structure, for example, a spinal cord, the tumor can be delivered with a high dose without crossing the limits of tolerance of the adjacent uh, overall uh, organ at risk. And to make sure that what we are trying to treat is actually being treated, we often use integrated imaging devices, for example, an X-ray or a sometimes a CT scan these days uh, that is linked to the radiation delivery machine. So that on a day-to-day -day basis, at the time of the treatment, we see what we are treating and deliver the treatment so that we do not miss anything inadvertently. In the context of head and neck radiotherapy, uh, as you have already known that lip and oral cavity cancers are high up just next to lung cancers and if you take other, or other pharyngeal cancers, together they make up the maximum number of cancers in our country and teamwork as I told you, everyone has to pitch in for the treatment. Surgery is the mainstay along with radiation and chemotherapy. The role of radiation along with surgery comes in different ways. The most important thing is adjuvant radiation. Now, what do you mean by adjuvant radiation? It means when a person has already undergone surgery, to minimize the chances of a relapse, patient may need radiotherapy following the surgery. This typically happens in buccal mucosa and tongue and such oral cavity cancers. Patients who have T3 or T4 lesions, when there are multiple positive lymph nodes. It can be also determined by the depth of invasion and other pathological characteristics like perineural invasion and lymphovascular invasion. And these days, very rapidly developing new risk factor is worst pattern of invasion, which Dr. Nayan told, uh, which has independently become a factor for consideration for uh, post-operative radiation and also positive surgical margins. In this situation, the patient receives head and neck radiation to the area of the tumor bed and the high risk uh, neck nodal area up to a dose of 60 to 66 gray over a period of 6 to 6 and a half weeks. However, the radiation can be a curative treatment 
not only in oral cavity and uh, tongue cancers if the T1 and T2, but also all the midline structures like larynx, hypopharynx, oropharynx. In these situations, radiation is a curative fact, uh, factor, uh, sometimes along with chemotherapy as well, and the dose is typically higher than the post-operative radiation over uh, 7 weeks or so, 66 to 70 gray, it is given. These patients, they require much more intensive supportive care because the uh, difficulty in swallowing becomes a little bit more expressed. Uh, however, the main advantage is that these patients, they do not have to lose their organ to surgery and therefore, as an organ preservation protocol, the quality of life following the radiation is better. And it has been shown in uh, large meta-analysis over many thousands of patients that giving chemotherapy can reduce the death risk of death by 19 percent and a 5 year survival of 6.5 percent increase can be obtained by adding chemotherapy along with radiation. Chemotherapy will be discussed in great detail after me by the next speaker, but I will just point it out that with these things go hand in hand and has to be considered whenever the clinical indication requires so. So, coming back to technique and these are my last slides, as I told you that conventional radiotherapy as was used with simple bilateral radiation ports is simply not acceptable today in terms of head and neck cancers because it exposes a lot of normal tissue and most importantly it, it knocks out the parotids which are very sensitive to radiation. It, the parotids will die out at a dose of one third the dose that is needed to uh, treat a cancer and that is irreversible and the patients suffer from dryness of mouth for lifelong and there are horrible consequences of that. Therefore, it is not an advisable thing to use uh, the conventional RT now. We have moved on to what we call as a three dimensional radiotherapy, which uses a three dimensional reconstruction of the human anatomy from CT scan and uh, MRIs and uses multiple small beams. It uh, categorizes the t a tumor in terms of what is a gross tumor, what is the uh, tumor where the subclinical disease could be there and adjust the dosages, high or low dosages accordingly. And it tries to save the sensitive structures like the parotid gland and the spinal cord. And if you see a compared to a three dimensional, two dimensional radiotherapy where everything in the field can be covered with radiation, a three dimensional CTRT can do a little bit better, but still not it is as better as it should be. Therefore, we still have to deal with sometimes the toxicities of mucositis, xerostomia, altered taste, skin reaction, tinnitus, necrosis, which to be very honest, I do not see much in these days because most of the patients like this, we do not see much of this kind of toxicity these days because we have actually moved on to much more higher precision radiotherapy, uh, which uses high degree of field shaping and intensity modulation and image guidance. Now, IMRT is basically evolved from 3D CRT as I have already told you and this is the classic example of what is a IMRT. Now, this is a clinical situation where you have a tumor and this is a sensitive structure which is uh, embedded in the tumor. You can think of this as a spinal cord and this as your neck node and the oropharynx. This is a 2D uh, radiation where everything is covered. As you go a little bit more accurate, you can bring it down and this is what a 3D planning does and this is what a more refined 3D planning does and this is what a more refined 3D planning does and then slowly you evolve into an IMRT and this is what an IMRT does. So, in IMRT essentially you can see that the organs at risk even though they are embedded in the tumor receive much lesser dose whereas, the tumor receives the full therapeutic dose. Now, this complex method requires a lot of time, energy and precision and training. However, if you see side by side, you can see a 2D radiation versus a 3D radiation versus an IMRT where you can see clearly the parotids and the spinal cord are kept out of their high dose radiation field areas and this is a basic standard of care when it comes to head and neck radiation is concerned. Now, does it help really? And there are plenty of studies, passport trial that I have mentioned here that shows that IMRT is vital to preserving the salivary function and not only that, there is a huge uh, survival and end result meta analysis that shows that IMRT has actually improved survival, not only just cut down on the side effects, it has actually improved survival in, 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 the, in the American population and therefore, IMRT or anything beyond that is a standard of care. But IMRT does not come without its uncertainties 
and what the biggest uncertainty is that it can the organs move you know the patient may move it may move during degradation therefore it is important that we not only treat with imrt we should be able to see what we are treating and this is all radiation machines including the ones in our hospital comes equipped with what we call as image guidance which is nothing but the radiation machine equipped with an onboard ct scan and x ray imaging facility which obtains a ct scan at the beginning of the radiation and matches it with the reference ct scan to make sure there is not an inch or not a, a few more than a few millimeters of error by which we don't miss the target and we don't inadvertently step on the organs where you don't want to give radiation so these are some of the examples of uh, igrt plans where you can see how conformally it can limit the dose only to the organs at risk or the uh, only to the targets and if there is a node involved inside which you want to go to a higher dose you can go up to a higher dose without spilling over into the nearby areas same of the more of the same and lastly in the cancer patients these big tumors as the treatment proceeds they change in their shape and size they continue to grow smaller and sometimes there's weight loss that can also alter what we have started treating in the beginning six weeks below six weeks ago can change therefore this is a classic example of a huge node halfway through the treatment becomes small in size because we are taking a ct scan every day of the treatment we can track these kind of changes and you can see here you know you can take a dynamic pet scan during the whole treatment and as the treatment continues to and the tumor continues to change we adapt our radiation at a regular interval depending on how much is the response maybe every two weeks every three weeks to make sure that as the tumor changes our radiation pattern also continues to change so to conclude imrt is a standard of care in head and neck radiotherapy it improves the quality of life by adopting this high technology recent data of improved survival is also seen not just the quality of life and the imrt whatever uncertainty is there in imrt because it's a highly precise technique those are addressed by usage of image guidance and adaptive radiotherapy it's an exciting prospect to further improve on on the delivery of radiotherapy thank you very much anyone has got any questions i cannot ask any questions for myself no well then we we'll move on to the next speaker uh, so dr arif is a medical oncologist he is a consultant medical oncologist at our hospital and as i told you that medical oncologists hold a key role uh, for head and neck cancers and he will discuss with you what is the role of a medical oncologist in management of head and neck cancer over to dr arif thank you sir good evening everyone today i will be closing the session i will be giving a very brief overview of systemic therapy in head and neck so systemic therapy forms the backbone of the treatment in mainly in the locally advanced stage and also in the metastatic setting when the tumor has spread to other organs systemic therapy has the role there so different classes of drugs have been used uh, in the systemic therapy the age old and gold standard is chemotherapy now we have moved on to targeted therapy it is kind of selective and a more effective treatment it adds to the effect of the chemotherapy so mainly anti egf or monoclonal antibodies we use in this targeted therapy the examples are like cetuximab panitumab and nimotuzumab the newest in the lot is immunotherapy it kind of improved the uh, survival and also has been more effective in managing the advanced stage cancers so depending on the different phases of cancer treatment we classify the systemic therapy into uh, definitive one in the definitive uh, we use it in locally advanced head and neck cancer here we use along with radiotherapy it kind kind of uh, sensitizes the tumor cells to radiation and also improves the local control and also improves the survival we use in also in the adjuvant setting also uh, combined with the radiation therapy it is uh, used to eliminate the residual cancer cells prevent the local and systemic recurrences it is used in the high risk category of extra nodal extension and also the margin positive cancers we also use systemic therapy before the definitive treatment which is called neoadjuvant or, uh, or induction chemotherapy where we tend to give chemotherapy before the definitive treatment to downstage the cancers and improve the resectability 
and also it is also used a part in the nasopharyngeal cancers also we give induction therapy followed by chemo radiation to enhance the survival decrease the systemic recurrence and also the improve the local control in laryngeal laryngeal cancer it is mainly used as a larynx preservation strategy and also in the metastatic cancers as a sole therapy it has a palliative benefit and also it prolongs the survival so these are the common drugs which we use along with the uh, radiation the cisplatin is the gold standard not many patients tolerate it because they have renal impairment they have hearing impairment in which cisplatin cannot be used so we go on to weekly cisplatin regimens that also is not possible then we go on to switch on to anti egfr therapy combined with the radiation so this also enhances the effects of radiation so coming to something about the egfr thing egfr is the cell surface receptors which are normally expressed on cells but they tend to be amplified and aberrantly expressed on the cancer cells so if we inhibit this egfr receptors they tend to block the survival and also inhibit this cancer cell growth and proliferation so this is the one example where we inhibit this cell surface receptors with the use of monoclonal antibodies this inhibit the cancer cell growth and proliferation so as we can see in this study so in locally advanced head and neck cancers if you use only rt and if you combine the other with uh, anti egfr with radiation it improves the survival and also has a excellent uh, benefits in terms of local regional control so it is very well tolerated with radiation not uh, it is very much acceptable acceptable toxicities except for the skin rash which is increased in the uh, targeted therapy arm so we also use systemic therapy in the adjuvant setting if you find some high risk features in the surgically resected specimen like the extra nodal extension which we the node uh, the tumor is be, uh, extending beyond the nodes and also if they find positive margins adding systemic therapy to radiation therapy improves survival uh, improves the local regional recurrence rates and also it decreases the distant meds also as seen in both of these studies induction chemotherapy mainly in the oral cancers if it is a very advanced stage locally advanced stage we tend uh, to a, do a assessment of the tumor if it, if it is the edema is extending up to the zygoma if the disease is extending till hyoid there is infra temporal fossa involvement that is the, that is high infra infra temporal in, uh, fossa involvement or valicular involvement we give induction chemotherapy the tumor gets down stage and then we can resect the tumors adjuvant chemotherapy as the sole treatment is indicated only in the locally advanced nasopharyngeal cancers if we do rt alone uh, i uh, and if we combine it with chemo radiation and give adjuvant chemotherapy in other arm it improves the progression free survival and also the overall survival and decreases the distant meds so in metastatic disease we use combination chemotherapy or single agent chemotherapy the difference in the is in the response rates and also adds minimal improvement in the survival so we can combine the targeted therapy also with the chemotherapy it improves improves the response rates and also the survival in terms of progression free survival and mid uh, overall survival so newest in the lot is the immunotherapy immunotherapy acts on the head and neck cancers here we inhibit the cell surface receptors binding to the ligand as we can see in the middle of the figure the pd l1 which is present on the tumor cells is engaged with the pd1 on the immune cells so this interaction inhibits the immune cells and they can't attack the tumor and kill the tumor cells so when we inhibit such an interaction with use of monoclonal antibodies which we call immunotherapy in this uh, scenario the uh, tumors uh, the immune cells get activated and they start attacking the tumor cells this is the principle behind using the immunotherapy it works 
in the metastatic head and neck cancer as of now it has been approved in pdl1 expressing tumors which we find out on the biopsy specimen by staining for pdl1 so pdl1 if it is expressed in the tumor cells and immune cells we give a combined positive score based on that we decide for the immunotherapy in the upfront setting so that's all from my side So, thank you Dr. Arif, uh, your lecture was short, but the role of chemotherapy in head and cancer is actually quite vast. Yes. And uh, we have always seen that concurrent chemo radiation as a part of adjuvant and uh, radical has been a mainstay for many decades. But for the patients who used to relapse, it was a very bad outcome for them. Uh, but with the newer modalities of chemotherapy, targeted agents and the immunotherapies, do you think it is possible to make a person of relapsed or metastatic cancer head and neck patient to live longer? So definitely the targeted therapy if it is added to the chemotherapy, it has a survival benefit though it is not much but a 6 months improvement in the survival and also nowadays we are using in the frontline setting immunotherapy for the PDL1 expressing tumors. So uh, we if it is more than 1% and 20% uh, PDL1 expressing tumors, we use immunotherapy in these settings and it is adding on to the chemotherapy backbone and also improving the survival. So the patients uh, it palliates the symptoms also they, they live longer with this therapy. So thank you very much for answer and thanks everyone who has uh, you know, patiently offered their expert opinion and uh, notions about how to detect and manage head and neck cancers. And thank you, the audience who has held on to this interful one and a half hours of meeting. We will see you next week again with another important area of malignancy that we'll discuss. Thank you very much.